Happy New Year and welcome to the first episode of 2024, our January 2024 episode of My Pip Monthly. My name is Amber Rouse Holloway and I'm a partner here at Secret Swordle's Troy office. Our January 2024 topics include, of course, a case law update. First, I'll be discussing the case of Peter Duato v. Denise Mellon, Indian Harbor Insurance Company, and Progressive Marathon Insurance Company. Then we'll discuss Farm Bureau v. Maple Manor, and this is both of these, I'm sorry, are unpublished opinions currently, but the Dualto case is a to-be-published opinion. And moving on to trending topics in PIP litigation, we'll discuss no-fault reform and changes to liability coverage with a recent case from the Court of Appeals. Now, first up for our case law update is Peter Dualto v. Denise Millen and Indian Harbor Insurance Company and Progressive Marathon Insurance Company. In this case, is a published case or will be a published case. Now, generally, drivers in Michigan will look to their own insurance policies for auto coverage for underinsured motorist benefits or UIM benefits. But in this specific case, the Court of Appeals analyzed whether an otherwise insured driver could collect UIM benefits from his own policy of insurance when operating a vehicle that was neither owned by another person or was available for his regular use as stated within a policy exclusion. Now, by way of background here, Peter Dualto rented a 2019 Hyundai Elantra owned by FlexDrive Services. Uh, Dualto entered into a rental agreement that would automatically renew on a weekly basis unless Dualto canceled the policy. I'm sorry, unless he canceled the contract. Plaintiff op- operated the Elantra as a Lyft rideshare driver at the time of the subject accident where he was rear-ended by Denise, um, defendant Denise Mellon while stopped at a traffic signal. Now, defendant Indian Harbor Insurance Company insured the Elantra through a policy issued to FlexDrive. However, Duato had his own policy with defendant Progressive. Duato rented the Elantra on a weekly basis for approximately eight months until the subject accident. The Progressive policy issued to Duato provided for UM, UIM benefits but there was an exclusion and the exclusion um, excluded UIM benefits for bodily injury sustained by any person when using any vehicle that is owned or available for the regular use of you, a relative or a related driver. The exclusion contained the caveat that it did not apply to a covered auto. Now, ultimately, Dualto brought suit against Mellon, IHIC and Progressive. He alleged that one, Mellon was negligent in operating her vehicle. Two, IHIC failed to pay PIP benefits and UIM benefits. And three, Progressive failed to pay UIM benefits. Progressive sought summary disposition, arguing that the Elantra was available for Dualto's regular use for ride-sharing purposes. Uh, Progressive further argued that Dualto continuously used the Elantra for an extended and uninterrupted period. Conversely, Dualto stated that it was Progressive UIM benefit exclusion did not define available for regular use. He believed that this phrase should be defined as a vehicle that is ready for immediate and continuous use or a vehicle that is free and able to be used continuously. Now, according to Dualto in this case, FlexiDrive exercised sole dominion and control over the Elantra. He further asserted that because he did not use the Elantra beyond the permitted use, or permitted personal use, and that he was the sole operator that his Elantra, that his use of the Elantra was not regular. The trial court ultimately granted Progressive's motion, holding that Tualto's use of the Elantra was ready, immediate, and continuous. The trial court reiterated that although the Elantra was owned by FlexiDrive, the rental agreement would renew automatically, thus FlexiDrive continuously provided insurance coverage per the agreement. Now, the trial court lastly held that when a vehicle was in an individual's exclusive possession and control for a period, said vehicle is therefore available for the regular use of that individual. Now, on appeal, Duato argued that the trial court's ruling was an error and there existed a genuine issue of material fact as to whether Elantra was available to him for regular use. Um, Duato now claimed that the phrase available for regular use was defined as a vehicle ready for immediate and continuous use or a vehicle free and able to be used continuously at any particular time, but is not available for regular use if someone other than the policyholder has sole dominion and control over it. 
Now, ultimately, the Court of Appeals here affirmed the trial court's ruling. The panel first determined that an insurance agreement genuinely provide coverage for the occurrence, and if so, whether coverage is negated by an exclusion. The Court of Appeals went on to add that the insurer bears the burden to demonstrate coverage while the insurer bears the burden of proving the applicability of the exclusion. Now, as a general rule, exclusionary clauses in an insurance policy are strictly construed in favor of the insured. However, clear and specific exclusions must be enforced as written. Now, ultimately here, because the parties agreed that the Elantra was not considered a covered auto, under progressive policy, the court determined the meaning of the phrase available for regular use. Um, so that definition was going to be provided by the progressive policy only. Now, analysis of the plain meaning, meaning of the term for regular use, um, the court noted the following that, one, Duato rented the Elantra, two, he drove the Elantra um, approximately 34,000 miles, three, he regularly, regularly used the Elantra for ride share, Four, he drove the Elantra 30 plus hours per week. And five, he did not use the Elantra for personal use beyond the allotted personal limit. Um, the, the court also went on to determine that the, that Duato was granted a non-exclusive non and non-transferable revocable license to use that Elantra. Now, this case defines what it means for a motor vehicle that is not covered under a personal policy of insurance to be available for the regular use of an other, otherwise insured driver. The Court of Appeals considered a driver's uninterrupted use of a non-covered article, auto, my apologies, um, the length of time that the driver was, that the vehicle was used at the driver's disposal, as well as the purpose of the use of the vehicle. Now, when analyzing the contractual language of a policy, typically the plain and ordinary meaning of each word and how it is used is given weight to the interpretation here. Next up, we have the case of Farm Bureau General Insurance Company, the Maple Manor Neuro, Center Incorporated. Um, this is an unpublished opinion per the Court of Appeals, which was recently issued November, 20, November 16, 2023. Now, this case deals with the Michigan Court of Appeals and how it overturned the trial court's granting of plaintiff's motion for summary disposition based on there being a question of fact regarding whether defendant was acting as a billing, billing agent only and whether the insured's care was provided in an unlicensed nursing home. Now, this litigation stemmed from services provided to claimant Veronica Fuentes Noguez um, after she was admitted to Maple Manor Rehab Center of Novi from February 2017 until December 2017. Um, the insurer was covered under a no-fault policy issued by Farm Bureau or plaintiff here. Now, during this period of time, Maple Manor Neuro Center submitted claims form to plaintiff Farm Bureau listing defendant's name as both the billing provider and signature of physician field. So there are several sections in the claims form, but here the billing provider and physician field have the Maple or the name of a person from Maple Manor. And also Maple Manor was listed as the field of service for the service facility location. Now defendant and Maple Manor are owned by the same individuals. Um, and that's Maple Manor Rehab. So basically, Maple Manor Rehab and Maple Manor Neural Center are owned by the same people. Now, in 2019, Maple Manor Rehab underwent a licensure survey by the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs, or LARA, where it was found to be in substantial compliance apart from non-compliance regarding nursing care provided, um, to seven residents in the New York ring without obtaining a license for beds, um, with the insured's bed being one of them. So with the claimant's bed being one of them. In 2020, Maple Manor applied to transfer nine licensed nursing home beds. So here, Farm Bureau filed its motion for summary disposition in the trial court, claiming that Maple Manor's billing for the services rendered to the insured was unlawful due to defendant not being able not, or not being a licensed nursing home and the treatment was unlawful since the bed was not licensed and that it was defrauded by defendant's presentation of the medical bills. The trial court ultimately granted plaintiff's motion, plaintiff meaning Farm Bureau's motion, finding that defendant unlawfully treated the insured as it did not have the right to charge for services um, due to being unlicensed as to the beds. On appeal, defendant claimed that it was only acting as a billing agent for the provider Maple Manor Rehab 
making its lack of licensure irrelevant and it, it did not commit fraud because of that. Now what's important here are the common law um, or, or the elements to common law fraud, which are one, the party made a substantial material misrepresentation. Two, that misrepresentation was false. Three, when the party made that misrepresentation, the party knew that it was false or made it recklessly without knowledge or its truth as a positive assertion. Four, the party made the misrepresentation with the intention that the other party would act upon it. Five, the opposing party, party did act upon it. And six, the opposing party suffered damage as a result of that. Plaintiff here argued that defendant was not entitled to payment under MCL 500-3157, relying on the case of Healing Place at North Oakland Medical Center v. Allstate Insurance Company. Now, ultimately, the court then overturned the trial court's ruling, finding there remain questions of material fact regarding whether defendant was acting as a provider and whether the insured's care was provided in an unlicensed nursing home bed. They held that the evidence of past or future unlicensed services is not enough to show services were unlawful at the time. Um, insurers must produce evidence showing that at the time the services were rendered, either the provider or the institute was unlicensed. So if you remember here, the care was in 2017. It wasn't until 2019 that the facility was found to be, uh, or the bed that the insurer used was found to be unlicensed. Now, moving on to trending topics in PIP litigation. Here I wanted to discuss no-fault reform and changes to liability coverage, uh, specifically uh, the case of Progressive Marathon Insurance Company v. PINA, and then the recent Court of Appeals decision issued early January 2024 um, of new MV Progressive Insurance Company. Now, in Progressive Marathon Insurance Company v. PINA, the court addressed whether all automobiles policies delivered or issued for delivery prior to July 2nd, 2020 are subject to heightened liability coverage limits effective after July 1st, 2020. Now for policies delivered or issued for delivery after July 1st, 2020, bodily, bodily injury liability limits of at least $250,000 per person and $500,000 per accident are required. However, those limits are subject to MCL 500-3009, Section 5, which allows an applicant for or named insured in such a policy to select coverages of $50,000 per person and $100,000 per accident. Now, in the case of New MV Progressive, um, the panel held that a parent's selection of lower limits was binding on her son, who was under 18, but owned the insured vehicle. Now, the new in litigation started with an Eric Moyer, who was a minor. He allegedly crashed his 2005 Honda Accord into Newton and her motorcycle in November 2020. Eric was the sole owner and title owner of that Honda Accord, which Progressive ensured through a no-fault policy that Eric's mother, Nike Moyer, purchased. Nike was listed on the application as the applicant slash named insured. Uh, the policy declarations identified Nike, Eric, and her other minor son as individuals covered by this policy. Now, Nike signed the application on September 3, 2020, and the application stated that the policy would be effective September 8, 2020 through March 8, 2021. Now, Eric was a minor when Nike signed the policy and when the incident happened. Now, for this 2005 Honda Accord, Nike, Nike elected bodily injury liability of $50,000 per person and $100,000 per occurrence. Um, and now, at the time, this was lower than the statutory defaults of $250,000-$500,000. Now, Nike, throughout litigation, Nike confirmed that she received a list of available coverage options. She understood that her coverage election applied to her and any other person covered in this policy and that the limits she chose would be effective as long as the policy was in effect or until she changed those limits. Um, now by signing, she acknowledged that she read and understood her choices and the potentially severe risk of selecting lower liability coverage described in the application. Now shortly after filing suit against Eric, Newton filed his declaratory judgment action against Progressive. Specifically, Newton sought a declaration that Nike's election was lower than the limits um, and that it was not binding on Eric and therefore Progressive policy limit was 250000 instead of the 50000 both sides moved for summary disposition and progressive prevailed. 
Now here, the Court of Appeals did affirm the trial court's decision. Um, the panel first rejected Progressive's argument that Newton lacked standing to file the deck action. Um, although not explained in the opinion, uh, Progressive's position or objection was based on MCL 500-3030, which states that in an original action brought by the injured person or his personal representative in the case of death resulting from the accident, the insurer shall not be made or joined as a party. Now, the panel found that Newton's suit was proper because she met certain criteria for filing a deck action. There was a case of actual controversy within the jurisdiction of the court, and Newton was an interested party. Now, ultimately, the panel noted that minors such as Eric occupy a unique and awkward place in, in space of contract law and tort law because they can own a motor vehicle and can be held liable for negligent operation of that vehicle but they have or they lack the capacity to enter into a contract. Now, therefore, the only way Eric could not meet the statutory obligation of insuring his 2005 accord was if his mother bought the insurance for him. Um, the panel also rejected Newton's argument that Nike improperly waived Eric's rights. Um, and finally, the panel rejected Newton's arguments for reforming the policy. The panel explained that the common law of reformation was not available, was not an available remedy here um, because Newton was not a party to the contract between Progressive and Nike, nor was she in privity with them, and that Newton could not establish that there was a mistake or fraud in drafting the document. And while the statutory reformation can be sought under the statutory law or MCL 500-3012, that provision would only apply if the policy was otherwise contrary to the statute, um, which was not the case here. And that is all I have for you guys for today. Um, thank you for attending our first episode of January 2024. Please stay tuned for some exciting new developments in our future episodes. And as always, pl please feel free to contact me should you have any questions and or concerns. Thank you.